that was great. We could just cancel classes and worship all day, right? I probably have the authority to do that, actually. Well, please bow with me in prayer as we start to speak here. Father God, we are grateful for every good gift you give us, including the privilege to be here in this place with these people. Uh, and we pray over this semester that you would open our hearts to you, that you would open our minds uh, to everything that you want us to understand and learn and, and equip us to, to be your servants, to do your good work. We pray for your word this morning that it would go out and uh, bear fruit. I pray in your name, amen. Well, welcome back, everybody. So good to see you. I um, hope you've had a good break. I've enjoyed, you know, kind of the, the typical small talk. Uh, you, you remember when you were in grade school and you came back from break and everyone was showing off their, their new clothes, that kind of thing? So maybe some of you are sporting some new uh, Christmas outfits, and that's great. Uh, a lot of you are talking about the terrible illnesses you had over break. Thanks for, for coming back. Hopefully you're fully recovered uh, from those. Um, but good to see you all nonetheless. Uh, I'm going to talk about joy today. Uh, this little guy up here may distract you a bit. This is a uh, friend of Ben Rector's, if you know who that is. Um, but, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, Christmas and the holidays and uh, just a little bit about what we did. So our, our family had a great Christmas here, and then shortly after Christmas, we uh, embarked on a road trip to the Midwest. Um, and, and some of you did the same thing. You got in a car, you drove multiple hours, some of you through snow and, and ice and that kind of thing. Um, for us, it's about a 15-hour drive back to kind of the the land of my youth, as they say, like, you know, homeland. Um, and, uh, and then every day, you know, where we stayed and where we were gathering with family, we kind of drove a couple hours each day. So it was just a lot of time in the car. And, um, and, and I just thought, I'm just gonna, not going to dwell on this too much, but just this is kind of how our family has always done this. Uh, so this is actually, um, use the pointer here. Uh, so this is, this is a few years ago, by the way. So this isn't this Christmas. But this is one of my favorite pictures from our, our kids' childhood. Uh, this is typically what we would do on a typical road trip. The back of the vehicle just jam-packed with all kinds of stuff that, honestly, most of it we don't even use on the trip, but we overpack. And then um, the kids just wedged in here, uh, you know, kind of zombies here. This one, uh, freshman at Gordon now. But anyway... Um, <laughs> This is what we used to do, right? And, and I want to say that's in the old days. So now we, we, we get in this, um, this big van, which I kind of affectionately call the, the great white whale. <laughs> but it's, it's this big 12 passenger van that we're blessed to have. But this is actually how we moved my son back from college. And this, was the, this is how he had to sit because the whole van, it was just the three of them, the whole van was packed full of, of stuff. So um, we haven't really learned much over the years. We've just, we've kind of packed it in. The other thing that, that kind of stands out about our trips is we typically, we don't always get a hotel. Sometimes we drive straight through. But when we do, there's one of my, my um, kids that will always say, Dad, she's so excited. She's like, Dad, did you get a hotel that has breakfast? So, so they love the free breakfast thing. And I don't know about you, but we all, at least in, in our household, we kind of notice that, that we kind of, resemble this, but everyone turns into savage beasts at that free hotel breakfast. I don't know if you've seen this. Um, I have flashbacks when I go by the waffle iron in Lane every day, right? That waffle iron, if you could picture six kids and two parents lining up to make waffles, while all the other, you know, hotel residents are kind of mad because my, you know, my kids are lining up eight of those cups to pour in and make the waffles for two minutes and 30 seconds. You know, I've got experience. I know how this works. And everyone's like mad because they want to meet, eat, eat their, their food right away. And so, and, and then there's kind of this, I mean, first of all, most of the places we stay, the breakfast food's not that great. I mean, it's, it's stale bagels, sort of bagels, quasi bagels, and these kind of Danish things that are really you know, frozen, half frozen, and, and the, the fresh waffles. And, but, but, you know, you start hoarding it all. Uh, and, and you kind of act like you're never going to eat again. Like this, this free meal, is we better get the benefit out of this. We paid for this hotel room. Uh, and it's like, you know, normal people that eat a light breakfast all of a sudden, sudden turn into a, a pride of lions over a slain antelope, like ripping it apart. That's our experience. Now, you're probably much more refined and, and, um, and travel much uh, easily, more easily than we do. But this is just, you know, people say, do you have a relaxing break? 
this is what I did. So I traveled in a packed car and we fought over waffles at the, the uh, Quality Inn or whatever it was. So it was a good time, it was a good time all around. So today we're going to talk a little bit about joy. Um, and, and just to set the stage, this is the theme for the semester. And um, most of the semester, the, the sermons around joy are going to come out of the book of Philippians. What I want to do today is just step back a little bit, try to set the stage for uh, for that study throughout the semester, and think about joy in the context of, of the whole of Scripture. As, as we know, when we read the Bible, we don't just pull one text out and, and build our whole life on just one verse, but we, we look at the whole of Scripture, understanding that God has, has breathed His truth into Scripture, and so we, we look at other verses. And, and so I'm going to look at four passages today that give us a sense of, of what joy is. But stop for a moment and think about that term joy. What comes to mind when you think of joy? We're coming off of the Advent season and Christmas, and there's a lot of songs about joy. Um, music brings joy to us. There's other things that you may think of. If I, if I ask you what brings you joy, you may think of friends and relationships. You may think of your family. You may think of food, pleasures of life that you enjoy. Think of the word rejoice and enjoy. These are terms that we use to express our joy for something. And, and we might even think that it's similar to happiness. You know, we, we celebrate here in the United States life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the, the, the rights endowed to us by our creator. So, so even that idea that everyone should be happy, it doesn't really work that way. We're not always happy, and everyone's really not happy. And so we might even observe that happiness and joy aren't really the same exact thing. Happiness might be more fleeting, more dependent upon the environment we're in or the feelings we have at that moment that might make us feel happy. But joy seems something more transcendent. Joy seems something that we, we could have even when we're going through difficulties. You, you could be, can you be happy and sad at the same time? Maybe. But you probably could have joy in your heart and still feel sadness or feel anger or feel other emotion. What do I want us to think about this idea of joy? I think there's a challenge in our age when we think about what makes us happy or what brings us joy. Uh, part of the challenge is that we're, we're in an age that, that has told us that the, the highest form of, of self-accomplishment or achievement is really to gain freedom and autonomy, almost independence from others. That true happiness comes when you can call your own shot, when you can make your own pathway, when you don't have to answer to anyone. Scripture points us in a different direction. And while we might pursue that element of freedom and happiness that, that glorifies the self, while that might be the, the age that we're in today, I want to show you that Scripture points us to a very different mindset around what joy is. And joy that comes not through uh, sort of pulling away from community or pulling away from others, but actually finding freedom in the, in, in the, the reality of our relationship with Christ as we submit to him, as we submit to accountability to others. So we'll look at four verses. Let me jump in here. First verse I want to, to point to, Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Pretty straightforward when we think about what this verse is saying. Now again, this is different from happiness. So if we believe that joy comes when we're in the presence of God, we know that we, we want to be in the presence of God at those moments when we feel sometimes at our worst, when we're lamenting, when we're hurting. And when we go to God, it's not just to get a quick fix of happiness. It's not just to get a quick shot of, of, of laughter or smiles. But the joy that Christ calls us to, that the gospel calls us to, that the scripture points back to again and again, to be in the presence of God, that joy is not fleeting. That joy is consistent. That joy is deep. And it does allow us to lament, to hurt, to be angry, to have tears, and still retain that sense of joy. So the first observation from scripture, joy is found in the presence of God. And I'd ask you to consider, as you think about joy in your life, joy in your heart, are you seeking moments to be in the presence of God? Now, God's with us. We don't have to conjure up God. 
But how much are you spending your moments intentionally entering into the presence of God in your heart, humbling yourself before him? So the first observation about biblical joy, joy is found in the presence of God. Second passage, this is the passage where we learn about what we call the fruit of the Spirit. So maybe uh, one of the more common passages, more well-known passages when we think about this concept of joy. I'll read through it. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, jo <coughs> love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Now note how the fruit of the Spirit are listed here in contrast directly to those works of the flesh, to those temptations, those sinful desires. Uh, let's be clear in our understanding of sin. First of all, sin is real. This isn't a list of personality traits or preferences. When the Bible talks about sin, it's the reality of those things which draw us away from the presence of God. And to be clear, those temptations towards sin are endemic in all of us. Now this itself is a controversial statement in our age. Because there's not agreement in our age on what is right and what is wrong. Or whether there's real sin or real, uh, a real God for that matter. But first of all, sin is real. Second of all, as we pursue walking by the Spirit in order to gain the fruit of the Spirit. Let's acknowledge that we may not always be perfect, but the Spirit is there to empower us, as this verse tells us, verse 24, because Christ has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, you may look at that list of sins and say, hey, uh, there's some crazy stuff on there. You know, I'm not that bad, right? But I would suggest that on that list of the desires of the flesh, we all can find some area where we're tempted. We all can find something that that draws us away from the presence of, the God, uh, of God, the presence of the Spirit. And this is the beauty of this promise of gaining the fruit of the Spirit. Christ's atoning sacrifice redeems you and gives you victory over sin. We just sang about this. None of us here, as, as, as we are, are, are in fellowship with Christ, as he redeems us, as he sanctifies us, none of us here have to be slaves to sin. Now, I have to confess, I don't always meet this. I don't always fulfill this. We're all imperfect. I'm probably at my worst on long road trips <laughs> over the holidays. And those closest to us usually can notice when we fall short. This is why accountability and submission to others is so important to this. Now, what inspires your imagination? What is it that tempts your heart? As you look at that list of sins, again, some of these we'd say, well, I'd, you know, not really drawn into that. But the idea of rivalries, revenge, the idea of justifying your own opinion, the idea of winning an argument over someone who's a rival, the idea that you have a rival, sexual temptation. The temptations that seize us on an everyday basis. Each of these listed here is in opposition to walking by the Spirit. And again, the promise is nothing on that list has to transcend your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen to that. 
so we can learn about joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's evidence of obedience to God. Third verse. Again, a longer one, but let me read this. From 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Pause there. It's introduction. It's pointing to that great hope we have, that great hope of reunion with Christ, that great hope of life forevermore, that great hope of being perfected at the resurrection. And then it continues in verse 6. In this hope, in this promise, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When I was growing up, uh, we, we sang a song based on this verse, and it was joy unspeakable. You may know that song or that term, joy inexpressible. This is the ESV. Uh, a joy that we can't fully explain or understand, but a, a joy that it leaves us speechless in our contemplation of it. A joy not just based on our, our salvific promise of resurrection and eternal life, but a joy that encompasses us and envelops us such that we can't even put words to what it means in our hearts and in our lives. That joy is not a fleeting happiness, an ethereal feeling about something that makes us laugh or smile or gives us uh, a good afternoon. I mean, I'm like you all. I love to look at videos of little puppies on Instagram too, right? That makes you happy. That's great. But eventually you've got to move on to something bigger, right? Happiness and joy, they go together, but it's not the same thing. So this verse also shows us in the second part, we can rejoice in that resurrection, we can take joy in knowing that we're confident in our salvation, but also that our salvation is proving through the tests and trials that we go through regularly. Refined like gold, this verse tells us. And even gold, the author points out, even gold is not everlasting. What does it mean to have a faith that would give us that inexpressible joy and a faith that's tested? What does that mean in an age when to be opposed by someone means that we disassociate with them? To disagree with someone means that we dismiss them. To have a different opinion from someone means that they need to be put away. How do we reconcile the testing of our faith in a culture that oftentimes diminishes Christianity, diminishes the role of God in our lives? This verse would suggest that the pathway for each of us as believers in Jesus is the pathway where our faith is tested and proven to be strong on the other side of that test. And that brings us that inexpressible, unspeakable joy. So our third observation. Joy is an overwhelming result of our relationship and future inheritance as children of God and a, and a result that's tested and tried regularly. And the last passage I want to see, uh, look at with you today, hits this point even further. This is Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope 
does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. What does it mean to rejoice in suffering? What does it mean, what does it mean to rejoice when we go through trials, to rejoice when we go through difficult situations? Now we see this in ways that we might not always associate with spiritual growth or with the Christian life. Many of you are, are athletes or you work out regularly and you see improvement because you, 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 you train, you, you put your body through difficulty so that it can become stronger and better. Many of you, almost all of you, have been through libido or discovery and you've learned that some of this hard uh, living in the wilderness can actually make you stronger. That tuna juice pays off, right? Think about the best teacher or coach you've ever had. Is it because they were easy? Is it because they gave you a pass? Is it because they didn't really think that much of you? And they thought, I'm not going to push you too hard because you probably wouldn't want to be pushed hard. Maybe some of you say that. But my guess is most of you would say the best teacher you've ever had, the best coach you've ever had, the best professor you've ever had, identified something in you and pushed you hard because they thought that you could be better. And when they did that, at first you probably didn't like it. But you look back now and you see that they saw potential in you and they were willing to invest in you the time, the effort, the energy that made you better on the other side. And you suffered. You suffered for it. Now that's just in everyday life. Think about what this means for us in the spiritual realm. To have our faith tested like gold. To have our faith produce a kind of rejoicing over suffering. Because we know that that suffering produces endurance. That suffering ultimately produces hope and hope doesn't fail us. So the fourth principle here, joy comes with a faith that's been tested, proven to endure, bringing character and true hope. Everything we do here at Gordon College is aimed around this idea. And joy is at the, the heart of it as one of those fruits of the Spirit. But we believe that each of you here, as you pursue Christ, as you pursue your calling, as you pursue training for whatever career or vocational ministry, whatever's in the future for you. We believe that God is working in your heart. We believe that God wants to draw you close to himself, wants that relationship with you. He wants to build that joy in you, that joy that comes through the challenging of your faith, the testing of your faith, and yes, indeed, the joy that comes when you, when you recognize suffering in your life as part of God's work. Joy undergirds our emotions. But emotions without joy, emotions without that, that foundation of joy, leave you fluttering around like a feather in the wind. Just drawn into whatever emotion or whatever idea is out there for you. Biblical joy, as one of the fruits of the Spirit, is part of what undergirds us in this life and is built on that foundational relationship and presence with God. That relationship that needs to be tested and tried. And this is the great irony. True freedom, as the gospel teaches us, true freedom does not come by removing any relationship, removing any obstacle, removing every boundary in our life. True freedom comes when we submit to God, when we submit to accountability with others, when we build relationships that are meant to point us back to that relationship with Christ. And as you set out for this semester, I ask you to think about who you've put in your life that might be holding you accountable. Who do you have in your life that's close enough to you to, to speak truth to you? That's not a rival, that's not seen as an enemy, but someone you hold close enough that can speak the truth to you and help you draw closer to Christ. I know in this room, in this, in this community, we have people who love to do that for one another. We all need it, every one of us. And my prayer for you, as you seek joy in your heart, as you seek to, to see joy grow, that you'll do that in the context of your relationship with Christ and the community around us. Let me close in prayer. 
Father, again, we're thankful to be here. We're thankful to be back. We welcome those who are new to our community and who've come back from semesters away. We celebrate the, the goodness of this place and the goodness of this community. And we ask that you would draw us close to you, make your presence known to us every day, give us victory over sin, draw us into relationships that will hold us accountable toward those ends. We praise you, Father, for you are good. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.